Hello friends, welcome to EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Joydeep Shorungi, Faculty, Department of English, Jogesh Chandra Choudhury College, University of Calcutta, Kolkata. Friends, we are into module 27, where we are going to learn the details of an apology for poetry written by Sir Philip Sidney. Friends, this module is prepared by Dr. Shutonuka Ghosroy, who is a faculty of Tarukeshwar Degree College, Hooghly, West Bengal. Friends, this module will tell us about the life of Sir Philip Sidney, one of the major poets of the 16th century, and we have an estimation that we are going to locate the text and apology for poetry in details. Friends, to start with a general introduction, Sir Philip Sidney 1554 to 1595 was a courtier, soldier, statesman, scholar and a poet of the 16th century. He lived during the Elizabethan age so was a contemporary of William Shakespeare. We should recall that what we call the Elizabethan age is really the age of English Renaissance. It begins in Italy and makes it to England during the age of Elizabeth. In this particular module, we both explore the core concepts and answers to earlier criticism of poetry through this particular text. We shall first discuss how Philip Sidney praises poetry for being the cradle of civilization, for being a channel of divine power, for teaching as well as delighting, and for combining and surprising the virtues of history and philosophy. We shall then move on to show how he refutes the main arguments that made against poetry. In order to have a total understanding of the text, we need to travel back in time. It is not just today that people have wondered if poetry is worthwhile. It has always had its critics. Like all critics before him, Sidney knew that he would have to answer not only contemporary attacks, but also he always have to answer Plato. Plato was always in the background and was the raison d'etre. During Sidney's time, there was no standard model of English literary criticism. Sidney's predecessors in the field of literary criticism suffered from a myopic vision. Critics like Wilson Asham or Eliot cannot regard it as a full-fledged critic. Their myopic vision confined them to the discussion of the formal aspects of literature only. Sidney could see how much decay and how much clearly than this contemporaries. Here's the first critic of English literature and real criticism began in England with Sir, with Sir Philip Sidney. In this sense, he is an innovator who broke away from the early critical tradition and created his own model. Chaucer had the critical spirit in him, but it did not find the proper trajectory. In 1473, Richard de Barre published the original Latin version of Philo Bivon. It is a weak attempt as it suffers from narrow outlook. William Caxton, the first literary icon of the 15th century England, showed some critical significance in his prefaces to the books. His critical observations are regarded as the first impressionistic at works. Sidney's apology and apology for poetry is a class of its own, altogether different from these critics. It was first published posthumously in the year 1595 in two separate 
yet more or less identical editions by two printers. The one which was brought out by William Ponosby was called the defense of poesy and apology for poetry. It is the title of the work brought out by Henry Wayne and Sidney was greatly influenced by the Italian Renaissance writers. We have to remember that before the Renaissance the critical vision was shrouded in darkness. Sidney took a bold step to emerge from this medieval darkness into light. He wrote the first treatise on literary theory using humanist concept. One thing that we should remember about Sidney's apology is that even though it is a brilliant work, it is more synthetic than original. In other words, most of the ideas that he conveyed in this defense have been said before by Aristotle, Horace and others. Yet, what Sidney brings to it is an incredible polish. He has selected, adapted from many sources in order to arrive at his own conception of poetry. Friends, now let us discuss on Sidney's apology for poetry. Nature never set forth art in so rich tapestry as divers poets have done. Neither with pleasant rivers, fruitful trees, sweet smelling flowers, nor whatever else may make the too much loved art more lovely. Her world is brazen, the poets only deliver a golden. Sidney in his apology states that poetry alone transcends nature. Though he was provoked by Gasson, Sidney's apology is more than a work of criticism. It is a remarkable piece of literature. The essay restores our faith in poetry as well as in ourselves. He was confident about himself within narrow critical thoughts. Rather, his clarity and elegance made him stand tall above others. One of the main tenets of 16th century Protestantism is man is not virtuous, is incapable of doing any good to himself or to the society at large. Sidney's essay is reflective of the humanistic worldview. Thus, he was much ahead of his time. Let me quote, and that the poet had that idea is manifest by delivering them forth in such excellency as he hath imagined them, which delivering forth also is not wholly imaginative as we are wont to say by them that built castles in the year, but so for absolute substantially it worketh. Whereas the 16th century Protestantism thought otherwise, Sidney re reiterates his belief in humanity and sustains or subst substantiated his point by arguing that poet's creativeness is the highest human faculty. This purifying of youth, this enriching of memory, enabling of judgment, an enlarging of concepts, which commonly we call learning under that name, so ever it comes forth, or to what immediate end so ever it be directed. The final end is to lead and draw us to the high of perfection as our degenerate soul, made worse by their clayway lodgings, can be capable of. Now, friends, it is about Sidney's views of antiquity of the University of Poetry. When the right virtuous Edward Wotton and I were the emperors caught together, we gave ourselves to learn horsemanship of John Piguilino, and one that great commendation had the place that is a square in this table.
and he according to the fertileness that the Italian wit did not only afford us the demonstration of his practice, but sought to enrich our mind with the contemplations therein which that most precious. This is how Sidney began his essay on rather curious note that we would say before launching a defense of poetry Sidney justified his stance by referring in the half harmonious or humorous manner to a treatise on horsemanship by Pietro Pugolino. The art of horsemanship can deserve such as eloquent eulogy and vindication surely poetry has better claims for eulogy and vindication. Sidney finds a just cause to plead a case for poetry since it has fallen from the highest estimation of learning to be the laughing stock for children. According to Sidney, all other human arts are subordinate to nature. Poetry alone transcends nature. Since the poet is maker, Shelley's defense of poetry is inspired by Sidney's apology for poesy. In order to have a better understanding, we can refer to Shelley's comment in this context. Shelley says, none deserves the name of creator, but God and the poet. As God the creator creates his own universe, the poet too has his own world. To attack poetry is to attack the roots of culture. To attack poetry is to attack the universality of poetry itself. Now, friends, we shall discuss on Sidney's definitions of poetry. Poesy, therefore, is an art of imitation, as for as Aristotle termeth it in his own mimesis. That is to say, a representing, counterfeiting, or figuring forth, to speak metaphorically, a speaking picture, with this end to teach and delight. In this definition of poetry, he follows both Aristotle and Horace. To teach and delight, he gives emphasis to the didactic purpose of his Horatian notion, and poetry must teach or delight. In order to encourage and inspire people to acquire knowledge and thus move out of barbarism, poetry is an art of imitation, and its chief purpose is to teach and to delight. Imitation does not mean mere copying or reproducing the facts. It means a representation of the transmutation of the real and the transformation from the real, the actual, sometimes creating, sometimes entirely new. In this context, we should remember the significant phrase, speaking picture. Both Plato as well as Aristotle has drawn parallel between poetry and painting. In Ars Poetica, Horace mentions as Ut Pictoria Poesis, taking the clue from Horace, Sidney speaks for poetry as a speaking picture. Sidney then goes on and classify different kinds of poetry, sacred poetry, philosophical poetry, didactic poetry and the right kind of poetry. The poets who write sacred poetry, the teachers of religion and the prophets are essentially theologists. Hence, they have their own limitations. The philosophical or didactical poets are restricted within their own boundaries as they are dependent on their material on external sources. He draws specific attention to his third group of poets. The third group of poets are real mark makers, as Shelley says, the unacknowledged legislators of the world. Sidney makes poetry free from all kinds of external limitations like metrical patterns. It is not rhyming and versing that maketh a poet, so more than a large gown maketh an advocate. Verse is the outer skin, not the flesh and blood of poetry. We should remember that verse is just an ornament and not the essential to poetry. Friends, 
Philip Sidney then goes on establishing the fact that poetry is superior to history and philosophy. In the next part of his essay, Sidney looks closely at the roles of a philosopher as well as historian in relation to the poets. He argues that poetry is above both history and philosophy. He says, the philosopher therefore and the historian are they which would win the goal, the one by percept, the other by example, but both not having both do both halt. Now, doth peerless poetry or poet perform both the whatsoever philosopher saith and should be done, and he giveth an perfect picture of it in the same in the whom the purposive as it is done in the couplet of general notion with a particular example. In other words, poetry is superior to the other two in teaching and essential human virtues. Even if we consider poetry as an art or craft, following Aristotle's definition of poetry, it is superior to all. Sidney believes that poetry can move men to better, more virtuous individuals rather than simply teaching. Friends, then Philip Sidney goes on saying and that there are four important functions of poetry or four ob objectives of poetry. He says its usefulness, its falsehood, its corrupting effect and Plato's condemnation of poetry. After the general discussion on poetry, Sidney now argues against specific critique of poetry. First, poetry is useless, a waste of time. Second, poetry is deceptive, the mother of all lies. Third, poetry is immoral, the nurse of abuse. And the fourth, Plato would have none of it and banished poets from the, from the republic. In answer to the first church, Sidney argues that all poetry useless is begging the question itself. Friends, we should have a brief view of Philip Sidney's overall idea on poetry and English drama. Sidney gives overview of pathetic state of poetry in England. He uses the term poetry in the original Greek sense, which denotes not only poetry, but all sorts of imaginative literature like drama. He sadly recounts England's step motherly attitude towards poets of his own generation. He strikes at the root cause of the poetical decadence. A poet is born and not made. Poesy must not be drawn by the ears, it must be gently led, or rather, it must laid. So, friends, if we are to sum up the module we have just discussed. In this particular module, we have traced out Philip Sidney as a critic. We have looked it, we have looked the we have looked the module as from the context of his criticism, his valuable judgments on poetry and its function. The role of poet poets was going to astray. Philip Sidney is someone who pulled the poets out of darkness and placed him in a lighted discourse. An apology for poetry or we can say an apology for poetry is a documentation which is a lighted discourse for poetry as well as for poets. I hope you enjoyed working together on this particular module. Good morning, classmates and fellow learners. As we have learned from this class, there have been attacks made against poetry. 
Poetry was called the mother of lies, provoking of the sinful nature and unproductive. In response to this, writers and poets posed arguments to defend poetry. In 1595, a text described by Alexander Young, 1881, as certainly one of the purest and most brilliant gems in the coronet of English literature was published. Sir Philip Sidney, a courtier to Queen Elizabeth I, wrote The Apology for, for Poetry, also entitled Defense of Poesy. In his work, which was probably written in 1581, Sir Philip Sidney gave four arguments, praises for poetry. Sidney saw it as an obligation to defend poesy. In his introduction, he says, I will give you a nearer example of myself, who I know not by what mischance, in this my not old years and idless times, having slipped into the title of a poet, and provoked to say something unto you in the defense of that my unelected vocation, which, if I handle with more goodwill than good reasons, bear with me, since the scholar is to be pardoned, that followeth the steps of his master. Now let us listen to his arguments. Thank you very much, Cariza. That is my student, Cariza Intal. She is a junior student uh, taking up education. Thank you for that. So I'd like to start with uh, Sir Philip Sidney uh, with an introduction, because Sir Philip Sidney uh, flourished in a very exciting age, and this is called the English Renaissance. Well, let me start with Renaissance as a whole, at is, as it started in, uh, in Italy. Now, first of all, the word Renaissance. Renaissance means rebirth. And rebirth in the sense of uh, rebirth in the interest of things and affairs of this world, fostered by a growing knowledge of the ancient civilizations of Greece and Rome. Now, if the Middle Ages, whom we have just left recently, were interested in matters divine, that means uh, out of this world, the Renaissance was interested in matters human, that means in this world. So, welcome to uh, this world. And we have just left the other world of the Middle Ages. Now, hence the term humanism, to uh, indicate concern with the things of this world. This uh, rebirth was marked actually by many discoveries, which actually hastened what is now known as a brave new world. In fact, uh, it started, it seems, in Germany when Gutenberg came up with the art of the printing press with the movable type. And in England, 26 years later, it was introduced by William Caxton. And of course, uh, in 1485, he published Sir Thomas Mallory's La Morte d'Arthur. This is the story of Arthur and uh, the Knights of the Round Table. Now, the Renaissance, a beautiful word, because this was one of the most exciting periods of exploration and discovery. As a matter of fact, at this time, Columbus discovered new lands. Vasco da Gama made the first sea voyage to India. Magellan, of course, circumnavigated the world and uh, discovered, quote unquote, these islands, the Philippines. And Copernicus, at this time, also published the earth-shaking and earth-moving, the Revolutionibus Orbium Coelestium. And of course, you have another name by the name of Paracelsus, who laid the foundations for modern medicine. And of course, this was the time of Michelangelo and Da Vinci, who personified the qualities of the Renaissance man. The Renaissance man who is a painter, a poet, a statesman, a soldier, a sculptor, a, an engineer, an architect, and so on and so forth. He is the epitome of all these disciplines. Now, this was called the new learning. And although the new learning, as it was called, was in full bloom in Italy, because Italy is the place of the birth of the new learning or the Renaissance, the Renaissance actually took a while 
in fact, quite a while. That's an understatement to reach England, partly because of Henry VIII's quarrel with Rome. We all know the history of Henry VIII's quarrel with Rome. And uh, Rome was in Italy. And therefore, this general English attitude towards Italy and anything Italianate was articulated in the textbook The Schoolmaster by Roger Ascam, which was a standard textbook in uh, educational institutions in England. And uh, it seems to say that if you want to follow the path of virtue, you have to shun Italy and Italianate manners. It, and it was only when scholars like William Grouchy, who went to Florence, and Thomas Linacre, who also studied in Italy, and Jean Colette, J-O-H-N-C-O-L-E-T, who is actually the founder of St. Paul's School, who also went to Italy, when these three returned to England and taught at Oxford and Cambridge, that was the only time that the new learning entered England, quite belated, because the, the new learning was already in full bloom in Italy. But England shut itself off from the new learning because of what happened to Henry VIII and his relationship with Rome. But through Oxford and Cambridge, because of their scholars who went to Italy, the new learning entered England through the back door to join Desiderius Erasmus and, of course, Thomas More, where these true humanists, scholars and men of the world, started to teach the new learning until it filtered to the populace. Now, it was in this exciting time where uh, Sir Philip Sidney was born. And this is known as the Elizabethan age. The Elizabethan age is another, uh, is another name for the English Renaissance. This is the period of rebirth in England. This was the time of William Shakespeare. In other words, they were contemporaries. Sydney, who flourished in 1554 to 1586, quite uh, a short period of uh, uh, years because he was killed in the Battle of Zutphen because he was a soldier. He was a Renaissance man. He was a soldier. He was a courtier. He was a statesman, a poet, a governor, uh, a Renaissance man, in fact, and also an exile, wrote an apology for poetry as a reply to a critic by the name of Stephen Gosson. Stephen Gosson wrote The School of Abuse, and the full title of the work is School of Abuse Containing a Pleasant Invective Against Poets, Pipers, Players, Jesters, and such like caterpillars of the Commonwealth. It was a scathing uh, uh, censure of poets uh, like Plato. And therefore, Sidney, Sir Philip Sidney, came to the rescue of poetry and wrote Apology for Poetry at the same time that he was writing Astrophel and Stella. Uh, one of uh, the major contributions to English poetry. Actually, Astrophel and Stella is considered to be the first notable sonnet sequence in English. Uh, Stella here is Penelope de Veru, the fiancé of Sir Philip Sidney, who later left him to marry a certain Lord Rich, as in Rich, 